Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Philip Cuenco. I'm a producer and an instructor here for the Leica Academy here in the United States. Uh, we've got a very fun program for you today planned. Our photographer for today is Francisco Marin. Uh, he was actually born in Mexico City and he uh, attended the architecture of the National Autonomous University uh, in Mexico. Uh, he's also studied at uh, La Salle University in Mexico, getting his credentials in intelligent buildings. So he's actually uh, an architecture photographer. Um, his published uh, works is in various books and he's actually got a new one on the way. And right now we're just going through some of his uh, work that he's uh, accomplished in the past over in Asia and the South Pacific. He's also um, hailing from Shanghai uh, in 2004, uh, where he started professionally as his architecture uh, work proceeded. He went ahead and went into Singapore in 2013. And between all that time, he actually started teaching with the Leica Academy in the South Pacific and Asia. His experience uh, is very vast in all different types of Leica cameras using the Q, the M, the CL, the TL. And he's been totally teaching since uh, 2006. Without further ado, um, please say hi to Francisco Marin. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today here. Philip, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How is Chicago? <laughs> uh, getting cold. Getting cold is a new experience for me after uh, five and a half years of being feeling a uh, hot 365 days of the year, but getting used to. I right. love the weather. <laughs> well, we have a we have a lot to cover today on Dia de Muertos, but we wanted to introduce the United States to you as a photographer and what you're actually known for in the professional world. Uh, so to get uh, some of the uh, creative elements out of the way, I guess, Francisco, why don't you go ahead and uh, talk to us about your eye and how you perceive um, architecture um, and how it relates into what we're about to talk about. Well, uh, in a few words, uh, the way that I like to think about architectural photography is uh, to see uh, through the eye of an architect, not necessarily as a photographer. So as a, an architect myself, uh, knowing all the process that uh, we do through design, uh, I try to pay attention to that details. So um, I try to, to, to find uh, spaces or, or uh, textures that allow me to, let's say, hide what really truly is. Like the images that you right now you are showing is in the station in, 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 in of the training in, in Japan. And they really don't have a right or wrong way to be appreciated. So, so the way that I captured them allowed me later on to put a collage together and create a, I will say, a well-balanced um, uh, 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 image that it can be pleasant to see it at any time. So that is what I like to do and, and, and find in my, in my photographs. So I like to be a very, um, very direct, very simplistic in the way of that I approach architecture because at the end of the day, during the process of architectural design is the details. Everything is about the details because you design for the people. So you want to be appreciated that. And of course, uh, a good cityscape is always appreciated, uh, like a, this image in Dubai or this is this tower in Shanghai. All of them, they are um, at amazing uh, places to be photographed and create an effect, a natural effect, without the need to be looking into a post-processing. So I walk a lot. I pay attention to all the details of how the 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 environment around uh, an architectural element plays. That is the way that I work. And of course, I try to do this kind of visuals in the one here, for example, in this image in the Abu Dhabi Museum in, at the Louvre, the, actually the wall I be, becomes the floor and the stairs and the roof become the walls. So it, I try to create these visual effects without manipulation. The only manipulation I have is my eyes. And that is what I try to do through my images. Wow. So getting into this mindset, I mean, what originally triggered your interest in photography overall? Well, um, actually, my father uh, was a, 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 a very amateur photographer, and he's the one that always keeps saying it. You, if you want to enjoy your life, you need to capture it some way. Of course, his life was always to photograph my mother, but uh, for me, it was the architecture that is told to 
to start to bring me the attention. And of course, the challenging of photographing an art because architecture is an art and photography is an art and try to put them together, it make it a little bit challenging. But uh, with all of these is what start to drag me into photography to try to have a voice and show to the world that architecture and photography, they really can be a very interesting topic to photograph. It can be very simple. It can be very complicated, but at the end, uh, it, it becomes pleasant to any viewer uh, uh, to enjoy this kind of art, photography and architecture. Now, uh, coming into the Leica world, we don't really see too many art photographers coming into the Leica world. How did that journey begin? What did that look like? Uh, actually, it's an accident. I mean, I used to have, uh, and I still have the Deluxe 4 and uh, Leica M6. And uh, but it wasn't until the digital era that I I got uh, like a T. And actually, the first shot that you were showing it was the first picture ever I took with the like a digital in in a, in a different way, and that was the like a T. And uh, I found it so lovely to be photographed with the with the camera. So I just start to adapt some lenses for my architectural work. And what I found striking is the, the high contrast that uh, Leica world offer. And that is what it drove me totally to switch from any other system into the Leica world. And, and I own, own actually practically every single camera on, on that. And I'm very happy just walking around with the cameras. And uh, I try to put the, the ambience of the architectural habitat together with the people that is living the thing. For example, this, this picture in Prague, uh, is the architectural space plus the people living the space, and that is what I I try to communicate to the to the people in my on my art. And I like how you incorporate the uh, the environmental uh, portraiture into the elements that Correct. you use as a photographer. Correct. Photog paying, paying attention to every little every little detail, it helps me to compose the way I I like. And this is what leads me to start to photograph a little bit more uh, street street life, Great. to put it in that way, events. Well, even though, uh, so that's his background, everybody. Now we're going to get into the heart and soul of what this presentation is going to be about. This is going to be uh, photographing festivals, uh, Dia de Muertos. Now, uh, Francisco, why don't you go ahead and give us an intro on how you came to this project and where you're going to lead us with the program. Okay, uh, this project of Day of the Dead or photograph the Dia de Muertos, it becomes a little bit an accident uh, in the way that uh, uh, is put. Um, I was looking to improve some activities with the Like Academy, and, uh, but in the middle, um, the loss of my father, uh, it was hit very bad by mother. So I decided to go uh, give her some uh, moral support. And I they really didn't pay, pay any attention to the date. So I applied to Mexico during the days that it happens, the day of the dead. And something that uh, maybe start like a, just a coincidence, it become a little bit more interesting from the, the standpoint of uh, a spiritual and, and remember that my father always will be alive as long as we keep remembering him, right? So it, something looking also for marketing materials to promote uh, a future trip to Day of the Dead for the friends of uh, Leica, then it comes into all of these. And, uh, and I find interesting to share to the people so they know a little bit more about the Mexican culture, Latin American culture in terms of, uh, of the Day of the Dead. That is how it comes all together. So, mm -hmm. Oh, we've broken down this uh, Dia de Muertos into uh, different subsections, and the first one we're going to cover is the altars. So, um, here we go. So, altars is a very important part of the festivities. The altar is uh, a place where we will place uh, food, a lot of sugar for sure, drinking, uh, drinks, and uh, elements that we believe we will make happy our ancestors, our relatives that already are uh, ahead of our trips. So um, you will find it everywhere from uh, inside hotels, stores, galleries, and every altar has one particular thing besides the food, and it's the, and it's the flower, is the flower of San Pasuchel that also is called in English is the Mexican marigold. And that is the typical flower, is a representation of Day of the Dead, that this uh, beautiful fl flower. And for example, this is in, uh, in the plaza in 
in downtown, you can see all the amount of food, bread, and of course the schools that are are part of the culture. Uh, the schools do not have the function to scare people, actually is to laugh with them and stay with them. It's, it's, it's a very, very interesting. And of course you will find all these attractive uh, um, altars made with anything we, we found in our, on our way. This is actually actual um, from outside of a government office. They have this uh, carriage and just the school full of flowers. It's something so simple, but at the same time, so beautiful to be walking around. So you make it pleasant to, to walk around. So uh, through the walks you will find in, in, in that the, the altars uh, has a different um, meaning for people. For example, uh, on the left in Puebla, uh, they have a lot of artists that were born there. So they will create these altars to honor them and remember them. So we have an actress in, in, in that place and very simple. Or for example, a public worker in the cemetery in Oaxaca, this guy was a, a fireman and died during a fire event. And the way that they honor him is not just with the food, all of that, they put this little collage and, and, and cartoons of uh, a school with the fireman, uh, fireman uh, helmet, right? And of course, also the corporate sponsorship, always important in events this kind. Uh, they make contests actually to create the, the most interesting schools. This one is, um, this is from, um, from a newspaper that is the son of Mexico. And uh, they, as you can see, it has a mix of uh, the sun plus an Aztec uh, reminiscence. So you make it very, very interesting, all the collage that you find through the streets of Mexico, uh, not just the towns, but in general, all the cities. Now, uh, something you will find uh, walking around is this one I call it the unknown uh, dead is uh, probably someone died uh, in this area and next to this tree. And uh, the, the way that the Mexicans uh, deal with this is that, okay, I don't know him, but that's here. So his soul stay here. So they will make something simple just to remember him because as I have said before, is as long as we keep remember them, they still alive. So this person is still alive. It's a very simple, just in the outside of the, of the sidewalk and you make it very, very simple, but very meaningful. So, uh, and of course, uh, we cannot forget that Mexico right now um, uh, has certain songs of full of violence and uh, it was all over the news, the, the Muertas de Juarez, the dead woman of Juarez, and doesn't pass a day and mostly in this kind of events that we wanna remember them. So this is inside um, a space that I uh, put one cross for each uh, woman that has been killed with their name at the day of the dead. And it's a way to remember them. It's the way to keep them alive and to show them that we're still fighting for the rights and, and to be try to calm, calm all the violence in, in my country, right? So it's, it's very strong statement, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see this kind of combination of colors and memories. Now, uh, while this all the, when, when does Dia de Muertos actually begin? Okay, so so uh, the tradition, they, they start like a 15 days before uh, the end of um, October, beginning of November, but the three strong days, it will be what is known as, uh, in English as the all Hallows, uh, all Hallows Eve, that it gives later the, the, the birth to the Halloween. And then we have the All Saints Day and the All Souls Day. So everything starts around October 30th and end on November 2nd. So that is where all the big events are happening. The people uh, putting decoration in the in the in the graves of their relatives, and uh, of course, uh, big cookings and and big parties because it's a party. It's not moment to mourn. It's moment to to be happy, right? Right. And, and even of the course, forefronts want to be happy, right? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> you will have a, it will be almost like a Black Friday, right? Uh, Everybody is throwing the promotions, but using the dead as a part of the promotion, because as I said earlier, the idea about uh, the, the schools is not to make us, uh, uh, people be scared of it. It's actually a moment of color, moment of happiness. That is the opposite, maybe with a little bit to Halloween, that in the Halloween, everybody will be dressing something scary. Uh, so 
with the schools in, in, in Latin America's cultures, basically in Mexico is, is colorful, it's, it's moment for party. So you can have pillows, you can have uh, coffee mugs, you can have keychains, as well as uh, any other elements. Um, uh, for example, you will walk around these old haciendas where the stores are surrounded by um, a patio that is surrounded by the stores. And in the middle, they have a fountain and they will place these uh, schools very elegant with, the, with their hats that we will talk a little bit more later, later about the lady with the hat. And um, so you walk around, they have promotions of food, they have promotions of, uh, of uh, in the bakeries. So this is a very interesting contrast that you find all walking around the, the place, right? So it makes it very interesting to be walking all around the streets. And of course, arts and crafts is part of it to call, bring the attention of the tourists. And of course, with a very good, um, Clay, Mexican clay, you can find a fine collection of schools that I don't know you would put it at your home, but uh, it gives a, always a good um, good decor at home. As a chef in a bakery, just to portray it, uh, we laugh about them. And it's not that we wish the other person, oh, I hope you're dead, it's, it's, it's part of it. It's, we Mexicans, we laugh about uh, uh, dead because it's, it's something you cannot stop. It's part of the culture. It's just part of the cycle of life. So why not to laugh about it? We say you better laugh about the laugh about dead before the dead laugh at you. So we laugh at them. I'm very creative. People find very creative the way to, that they will do their storefronts. Um, very fashionable. And of course, um, they have a way to move. They have the motorcycles to be roaming around. And as you can see, this is full of color. Is uh, there is a smile all the time in the schools? You don't see a school uh, uh, making you scared. Actually, you can read in the poster in behind that picture. It say uh, the translation will, will be accepted. You are dying to leave it. And they are talking about the event that it take take place in the town during the night because everything happens at night. In the day, it's like everybody's trying to re recover from the night before about the party, but um, they getting ready for the night. Uh, across the city, restaurants, uh, walls, you will find this kind of uh, graffitis where it represent, you can find the representation of something very Mexican. In this case, is the mariachi and the rooster. The rooster is related to bravery, is related to fight, is related to a certain level of power. Um, in Mexico, it's very famous, the, the, the the rooster fight or the cook fight that actually they say is Mexican, but the truth is it, bring, it was bring to us during the colony by the, with the Philippines. So this is a Filipino uh, uh, background. So we make it ours too. So, so they make it very interesting. And of course, once the event is done, this image will disappear and it will become unique. So you can capture images that will be unique at that time, at that period of time, and never repeat this, this graffiti again. So the gear that we're, are the uh, the shots that we're looking at right now, what type of gear are you using for all this, uh, for all the viewers out there that are wondering what type of gear? Uh, all the pictures we're taking with the Leica CL and the Q. And my decision to go to this event with these two cameras, besides that I was the ambassador for, for, for the uh, Leica CL, is because it makes it a very compact combo. Uh, it's a lot of crowd during this event, and you want to keep yourself very, very uh, uh, light. Plus, um, although I will have loved to be having uh, photographing with the M, is so many things happening at the same time in, in each corner. And actually between 10 yards, you have someone making a, a, a dance and the other one is playing an instrument. So it's very complicated to set your mind about what you want to do. So you wanna have uh, uh, equipment that will allow you to, to be fast. Uh, uh, this this last picture here in this section is uh, actually uh, interesting because it's the reflection of the of the situation in Mexico, the economy. Uh, this one is um, a school outside of a jewelry store, but outside uh, a beggar asking for some coins. So it's the contrast you find in jewelry store. They know where to position so someone that pass by or come out of the place can maybe offer a coin. We need to remember that Mexico is still a 
uh, trying to develop the economy. Uh, a lot of things have happening, so so we're still there, and it's important for for me at least to remember that that is the current situation of my place. So with the you mentioned the CL, let's uh, let's go ahead and um, I guess talk tech for a little bit here. Uh, yeah. With the CL, what, what lenses do you prefer, and what would you recommend for people out there that maybe they want to go photograph the, the, this themselves, and what they should take with them? Well, um, for for this kind of events, uh, I will say that uh, any any equipment that allows you that you feel comfortable. Uh, with the, the results and most importantly, you feel comfortable to put it around your neck and have it in your hand, it will do so. That's why, for example, in this case, I, I, I choose the Q and I choose the, the CL because they are small. I can, in one, I have a beautiful 28 and fast lens. And in the other hand, allow me to be switching between the two or three lenses. I did not come with telephoto on this one because the telephoto will make it a little bit more difficult. So a wide angle or a fast lens, it will, perfectly be good doing a, a a good a good combo right so i will recommend the people to travel with it as light as possible but with the equipment that they will really truly need in these events don't bring equipment that you don't need <laughs> really just make it heavy the wide lens you're using on this this is the 11 to 23 uh, uh the 11 and 23 was not used i was using the 18 50 56 and the 23 yeah. at that time very good. Now we have the audience. Uh, yes, uh, you know, it's some interesting questions I'm seeing there. I don't know if you also in that. Um, okay, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit later. Uh, there are some questions about architectural. Of course, I would love to talk about it, but let's go dive a little bit more into the Day of the Dead, and maybe later we can answer some questions regarding architectural photography. I see some about lenses and things like that. So, okay. So the ambience, the ambience is a party. The ambience is color. And the most important thing, kids are involved. Um, this picture really, it tells how children get involved during these festivities. And I'm proud to say that to keep the traditions uh, alive are part of this uh, culture. And mostly in these kind of towns where um, where uh, the, the, the families involved. I mean, uh, these kids have been working with the, probably the mother and the father for months just to get the costumes right, the, the, the top uh, right and be on the celebration. So you can follow them. If your mission is to try to capture one specific group, you can follow them for hours, two, three hours, nonstop dancing, walking around, uh, singing. So it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, event to be to be around. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can find inside the cemetery, the event is taking form. So here, these two kids probably honoring, I will say, uh, 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 some um, grandparent. But you see, it's a smile moment. It's, 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 it's no sadness. It's, it's the memories what they make you smile. If you think about it, when you're thinking about a happy moment, regardless about with who you have it, you always will be by accident, a smile, uh, 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 draw a smile in your face. So this is no deception, right? Within all the graves, it's a happy moment. It's, it's a moment of remember happy moments. Now we were talking uh, during our, our rehearsal uh, regarding like your ISOs and low light techniques. Do you want to go ahead and uh, talk about your low light performance techniques with the uh, with the lenses, your ISOs that you're preferring with these? And I well, guess I've been, as well. yeah. Oh. Uh, it's very dark. Basically, in the cemeteries, it's absolutely dark, zero light. Uh, you are talking about sometimes you need to be working with one candle. And at night, I, I don't know why I'm always unlucky. I always ending working at night when it's raining and over it's, it's just crazy. So uh, in some of the pictures, although I will consider that uh, I have some fast lenses, not as fast as I would like to, uh, I had to crank the ISO. However, I found out that, uh, for example, in the queue, some pictures at uh, ISO 3002, 6004, it make it perfectly workable and printable in a reasonable size. And on the CL at uh, 3002, it allows me to actually uh, escape with, uh, with, with good shots, with a pleasant. Um, sometimes, depending on the light that you are hitting, I will suffer a little bit of a shift 
uh, color, but uh, in the majority of the cases are perfectly fine. And I will very happy when I was testing the camera in this event that I was amazed about how it retains the purity of the color. So if people ask me how long you, you have to spend in post-processing, is minimum. I really honest is, is minimum. I was very pleased with the colors. And as you can see, the ambience is, is uh, crazy. People dancing, regardless about where you come from, uh, colors, people wearing different costumes and, and uh, either the skeletons or just like a, anything that they can find that they made them happy that night, right? And and that or, make it. So that is the technical part. Like I don't this. pay attention. Are you doing? Uh, are you using a lot of burst mode for a lot of action like this going on? No, actually, I was no burst. Is every picture was only one shot. Uh, I why maybe by uh, by mistake? I don't know. I was more. Uh, I was thinking more about enjoying the moment. And as I say earlier, uh, this one just was part of creating marketing materials, not to try to to expose. The, the the tradition in a more uh, um, a bigger way, but I found out that the camera, the the way that they uh, uh, out of focus was so fast that, um, and with a little bit of experience, I was not ne in the need to have um, continuous shooting. That actually, I'm fan of this kind of events. It should be with continuous shooting and continuous focusing. That actually, with the with the that two cameras are pr pretty good. It's pretty fast, but they came charred, they come as I was expecting to, to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, this, this picture is one of my favorites because you see the, the melting pot of the cultures along the festival. So in the middle, we'll see uh, this, uh, we call it Paisano, that means uh, 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 from our own country. Then a guy on the bottom right in the, in the triangle composition, we have there uh, an American getting this is a school draw, but you see how nice the, the, the makeup artists are amazing. And we have in the upper left and an Asian uh, getting ready. We have a lot of Chinese and Japanese visiting Mexico for this particular event. And actually interesting with China because China also is in the Asian cultures, they, they also play a very important role in, 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 in their lives, right? So, so it's interesting that they are open to start to appreciate that in a different way. So that that was very pleasant to find this 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 melting pot around these these towns. Yeah. So many Americans and people all over the world are interested in documenting Day of the Dead. Uh, do you have any advice for uh, I guess those that are trying to come to Mexico this time of year? Uh, I don't know how the festivities are as far as isolation goes with COVID and all that. But is there any um, tips that and advice you might have for them if they decide to make it down there and photograph this? Uh, well, first, don't go this year. Don't go this year because uh, COVID is pretty bad in Mexico. Next year, it opened the opportunity. The only thing is you are planning to go a book way in advance. Uh, most of the good hotels or good neighborhoods to be around next to the party because you really want to be, be next to, so you don't miss an action. Uh, uh, they are booked with one year in advance. So you need to make this way, way in advance. Second one, again, travel light. Always uh, light allows you to move uh, faster, allows you to protect yourself because like in any part of the world, no matter where you are, when you are within crowds, uh, you have pickpockets, you have people aiming at your equipment. And although, and this is interesting, is like equipment is so discreet that they do not really pay so much attention to the camera. They prefer to go through to, to pick equipments they, because it's an uh, interesting way to do it. And as you can see, it's a lot of people, a lot of colors uh, here. I crank a little bit the, the, the eye saw, but it makes it so nice, so pleasant, the colors, so natural look. Uh, it's warm because the lights are pretty warm. And um, this is the, 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 the festivity around uh, a little bit if we can magnify this picture in the back you will see already a parade coming my way and uh, and you just move outside and you will find these kind of things you see a school over some will put a little bit of horns but this is a group of uh, teenagers walking around and they are hundreds hundreds of them walking around if i show you all the photos we have it's just a lot it's a lot but uh we having just a small a sneak peek of what an event and capture this event can be. So that's why you want to go again with a couple of equipment that are easy to move, small, and be trying to catch the action all the time.
No, I'm I'm interested in photographing this now too. Uh, what what city are we looking at here? Is this Oaxaca? Well, this is Oaxaca. Actually, uh, is uh, two main cities where it happens. This in a big way. Besides Mexico City, Mexico City is a little bit apart. It, one is in Michoacán, in Pasco, in the island. That is pretty good, but it's overcrowded. And right now it's a little bit dangerous, but the safest place is here in Oaxaca in one of the uh, South states of Mexico. It's a lot of going on because also it melts the old culture plus the plus the, the, the event that is a, a fusion of the old days and the Catholicism during the, the colony times. So it's a pretty good way to visit and it's many, many towns around. And of course, well, um, this picture is a little bit, um, not a little bit, it's very, very interesting, is uh, during the parade of the Santa Muerte. Uh, for all those friends that are interesting to know a little bit more, just go, uh, caution uh, when you are looking into this because uh, it's a very strong theme. Uh, the Santa Muerte is basically related or is connected to the the drug cartels and violent groups in Mexico. Uh, it was not intent under that circumstances to be, but they had becoming a part of the group and they will be, be part of the, of the parade. So they will pass uh, 10, 20, 30 cards with the Santa Muerte in, their, in the top of the cards being part of the, of the demonstrations of the Day of the Dead. But if you look very careful into the into their faces. In this case, it's a bride. In any moment, is is trying to portray being scared of it. It's, it's trying to portray that uh, they also have life and and they they do and they are protected by them to the walk to the afterlife. That is part of that. Right. Very when, controversial. Very very controversial. When you're capturing all this, are you uh, are you having it with a story in mind, or does that all just come naturally later? Like, are you just going out and shooting everything that you can, and you try to piece it together later, or is there a structure to, you know, approaching this? Well, um, when I was already during the event, in the beginning, I felt totally lost because I say I, I, my intention was not to to capture all that spirit in once. So I need to improve during the time that I was there. So I just start to find a way to put all together. So first I need to break it into, okay, this is a lot of things happening in this event. What is the important part? So one, of course, the decoration, all, all that things happening in the front stores or in the, on the, or in the graves. Then all the people and the ambience, of course, but the ambience is great, but all the elements that surround the event. And the most, one of the most important ones is the characters because now we are talking about people. All the other part is uh, like uh, the, the front stores is more the economical part, is the, the commercial part of it. But the characters are one of the ones in make Day of the Dead interesting and a happy moment. And for that, you have a several uh, individuals that during your walks you will find and they are perfectly fine. You can invite them to take a picture. They will be very open to do it, but they have a story behind. There is a reason why they dress that way. So the characters are definitely part of it. So that is the way that I break it into different things, which later will be a little bit about music. And in the end, I was, I was able by uh, also, I call it by accident, uh, uh, that I found a place that we will see later that all that elements came together, that it came in game on all these little breaks that we are having by themes. Uh, this one is, let's say, the lady in the left is called La Katrina. And I make a little bit of uh, research about how they call it in English and it's called um, the theme of the, of the dead. And um, this lady, as you can see, in no moment is offering you any to be uh, scared of her. And actually this goes back to the times of revolution to a cartoonist that was finding a way to represent the, uh, this, uh, this false illusion that anything coming from Europe will have a better status, economical status or more knowledge than the locals. So uh, a cartoonist in Mexico start to draw this kind of characters to in a way of satire. To, to laugh about at uh, that time, uh, one of our um, politicians that was in power that the year after 1910 started the revolution. 
And the representation is about no matter how much money you are or what educated you are, we are all gonna end like everybody else, being a bones in a bone. So, so this is the characterization that has. And of course, on the other side, you have the 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 counterpart in the male in the male uh, form that is El Catrin. So this is a couple that the intention in the beginning was to laugh about that uh, um, accommodate people uh, from Europe that used to live in Mexico uh, and. Um, and that is what I mean. You can find a lot more information about it than La Catrina and Catrina. Uh, this is the mariachi. This is the symbol of Mexico of a good party, either for cry for a lost love or for try to conquer a love. So also is represented there in a school moment with the full, full uh, uniform of the mariachi. And it's beautiful, the colors and um, uh, I mean, Technical for technical part, the colors are as they come out of the camera. Very little process. So, Francisco, we got a question from Alex. Uh, do you encounter any animosity from your subjects while you're shooting, or are they just generally okay with you photographing them? Ah, uh, well, they expecting for you to do it. They want to be photographed all the time, and they ask, "Can you send me my pictures?" Yes, of course, I can send you the picture. And uh, they enjoy it uh, actually because they invite the people to be part of it. So as I will tell later, uh, around the people, when even when you are inside the graveyard, people will invite you. Hey, you want a beer? You want a taco? You want a torta? I mean, they share with you because it's 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 a happy moment. It's a moment to share. So they are very open to be photographed. Even even during some photographs, I think the next photograph here we see this is a very interesting picture. Um, this is a kid that comes from a very local uh, indigenous uh, 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 group, and he's wearing that uh, traditional um, suit that they have, and the school that they become more part of the of the fusion. But this is a very authentic uh, um, uh, uh, indigenous uh, local person there, and he's a kid, and that is fantastic to find. And you can see a little bit in the back the kids coming. Uh, it's great to see the kids involved on in this. So um, it makes it very, very interesting. Uh, how's growing up with this culture, uh, has it affected you on the way you view life and death? Well, um, I need to be honest with you. Um, to, I, was, I have never been afraid about to die. I think Mexicans, we are more worried about how we die that, that we are gonna die. So it's, is 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 part. We understand that it's part of life. So once you're born, you start to die. That is what we say, and as in many other cultures. So what probably impact me is that um, at that moment I was remembering more my father because my mother was during this trip with me, and we will remember him not because he died. The interesting part is we will remember him how he used to live. That little details that made me look so happy. And when we were having these kind of a candy shots, this is a candy shot during this uh, dance, dance around the street. Uh, my father was like that. He just to be capturing candid uh, images of all of us and, and certain events. So it, it, it hits me that that was my father, that my father in that moment was with us walking around these streets and enjoying the time. So do I feel sad at that time? Not really, actually I was happy that for some reason I, I was in that moment there walking around. So uh, as you can see here, even the tourists are among, among the dancers all around participating in the festival. So yeah, it was, I thought it was gonna be hard, but no, actually it was a great time. And for my mother, actually she, uh, she re-energize her, her, her thoughts about my father and it started to change a little bit. Instead of being feeling down, she started to be more happy and more involved during the event. It was a great time. So would you say that was more of a personal job or a professional job on that trip? It was personal and it becomes part of a job that actually I cannot complain. When, when something <laughs> that is so personal become part of the job and you enjoy it, oh, it was amazing. So that's why, um, I think is uh, to share these little things with people. It made me very happy. It made me very proud about my culture, about my heritage, and uh, and share it around the world. And I've been lucky to travel all around the world and see the different customs that it leads you to this. 
this is very interesting. So I am always open mind to see what happened in each country. Then you treasure not just that, but also your own. And that it make it great to have an event that is held in your country every year. It becomes more famous after the um, uh, James Bond movie in Mexico City, uh, uh, that they have a big parade with all that the skeletons dancing in a monumental way. It becomes very, very famous. And uh, now everybody want to be there. So hopefully uh, soon after the COVID, everybody can go and join the party. It will mm -hmm. be good. Yeah, and you have a, a nice series here with the musicians now. Yes, music is a very important part of it. And as you can see, people, we hire a, a singer to go and perform for their relatives or their ancestors. So um, you walk into the cemetery and you find either a singer or uh, you can find in the middle of the night also uh, uh, people uh, walking the start, this is just around the, before it start to get really, really dark during the parade. Um, young people participating, playing on instruments. They have been practicing for months to good, uh, to put up good performance. But the performance is not for the people that is watching them. The performance is for their relatives and ancestors. So they really do it like uh, they are present, like uh, they are going to be judged by the grand, great grandfather or something like, that. oh, you know what, you you really play very bad the trumpet. You have no practice enough. So next year I'm going to be here again, listen to you, and you better wake me up with a very good tune. So that is what the musicians try to do too. They they also have their ego with their, with uh, their ancestors, right? And they're happy. Right um, now... Living overseas in Asia, has that affected or has it changed your view on how you view uh, this ceremony now when you come back home? Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, I appreciate it a lot more because believe it or not, I before this time, I had never been present in one of these celebrations. But I've been in China during the celebrations in uh, on, on one of the dates in Hong Kong. My, my wife is from there. so. I was connected somehow, but not with my own country. So this become a part of the discovery. I always was kind of, a, no, this, I don't think it's, a oh, wow. Yes, this is something that it will become uh, old. It's old, but it becomes to us really quite new for me. Now, we, uh, we, we talked about uh, the next shots coming up. We kind of geeked out about these the other day on the technical level. Um, yeah. Pretty interesting on your thought process behind it. Um, would you like to talk about how, what we talked about uh, for the users that are just wondering the technical aspects of night photography and getting a shot like this? Well, one, you need to be a little bit, A, lucky that there's some light. B, that uh, you will trust the camera with the, with the technical part, and basically in the ISO. Of course, you wanna have a fast lens uh, for, for these, but I need to be honest with you. I was not thinking ISO because if I start to think in the technical part about the behavior of ISO and all of that, I will lose the moments. And you start, you stop enjoying a moment because you are thinking in the technical part. So what I did is, you know what? I'm gonna go as wide as allowed me the lens. I'm gonna crank the, the, the ISO as, as much as I think I will be comfortable with that. And so be it. So, I also decide to go for black and white to in that moment to keep myself a little bit more focused in the moment because if I start to worry about how the colors are going to be looking under this light condition and all of that, again, it's so many things happening at the same time that uh, 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 I cannot be thinking in, in so many details. So so I was just there having the, the, the Leica Q at, uh, with the fast lens that made me feel a lot of uh, very, very safe. And having the, 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 with the CL, the 23 millimeters lens also made me feel quite safe. So I go for it. I said probably at 2.8 or in one of the cameras, I set it up at a, an aperture of 5.6. Everything was taken at a, a handheld. Uh, I saw someone was asking me, Cindy is asking if I was using a handheld or using monopod. No, handheld all the, all the time. Uh, being just careful in the way that that's holding. And that is the advantage about bringing a, a small equipment. Allows you to have a better control on your on your shake. And, uh, and, and we talked about the ISO on, on something like this one. I mean, oh, yeah, yes. This like one was 20,000, 20, right? 
No, uh, this one actually is 6004. Why that was, okay. it, it brought a little bit my attention is the halo that is created among the helmet of the, of the um, players there. I was really, really confused about, wait, 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 is this that I'm over sharpening or what did happen? No, actually it's because the same light that is in the background because in behind the cemetery, it was a big event happening. So that pushed a little bit the light and it's a bad light. So I need to uh, to increase the ISO to try to get that, um, that uh, a little bit of the detail in the face. So um, of course, in this place, you don't wanna be using flash actually, I don't know, uh, very few people will be using that. And the musicians will be all over all night. These guys are already nine o'clock in the morning following day, and mm -hmm. they are still playing. No, they don't rest for 48 to 72 hours. They play with no, no stopping, nonstop. Now, are you one of those photographers that shoots only raw, converts it all later, or do you shoot both the JPEG and raw? And you're like, oh, you know what, the JPEGs work for me. I'm just gonna work with these or, uh... I guess, like, what does your, your process look like uh, when it comes down to getting them under the computer and finalizing your shots and deciding what to, to do? Okay, them? I shot RAW plus, plus the JPEG. But my style of shooting is I will be converting my, my monitor or my uh, screen, my back screen, into black and white. So I don't see color. So I can just focus on composition or the, or the elements that are happening in front of the lens. Then, and because I like to be um, shooting in a high contrast, what I will do is later in post-processing, I will be comparing my JPEG high contrast uh, file versus the raw that I'm converting. Of course, after many years of being using the cameras, I already have my own my own uh, uh, settings for black and white conversion. And now we make it a little bit uh, more, uh, much easier to convert my images. But my process is raw plus JPEG, black and white. Right. That is what I do. All right, now before we get into the uh, into the next section, let's go ahead and take a look at the chat really quick here. I'm just trying to yeah. see if any, anything from the panelists here. Um, let's see. I think we think we've got one. Oh, do you own a film camera? 35 millimeter or six by seven? <laughs> uh, sorry? Do you have a film camera? Oh yes, I have a film camera, it's the Leica M6. That is uh, my favorite camera for go around and remember how to see. Because, uh, you know, with many options sometimes in the, in the with zoom lenses, uh, I have the tendency to lose my, the education of my eye. We can call it that way. So to mount a 35 or 50 millimeters on um, on my M6 allow me to refocus and learn to see again and get out of the a little bit about the the zoom the zoom lenses. That's why I always prefer the the prime lenses. And something that I found also very very interesting on it allows me to slow down my rhythm of photographs. When you have an, a a camera a digital camera that allow you to have in one car, a thousand, two thousand pictures. I believe that some photographers we can become a little bit lazy in the way that we see photographs. So the film photography allows me to slow down, retrain myself, and have my time and my inspiration time. That's why sometimes my process is I go to M6, then I jump into M10, then I move forward to my CL or my Q. <laughs> that is what what is my processes. Great. And um, now we have the macabre. Oh yes, it's part of the thing. And, and it's not really that it's so scary, but it's funny to find how an elements that are very natural somehow during the, all the year, it become into the part of the celebrations too. These are very typical little dolls made by the indigenous people of the region. And you can see the samples in right and left in the bottom. That is how they regularly look. But during these festivities, they will make it also on a school and they have their smiles. And um, But walking around the cemetery, this is, I'm telling you, it was rainy, it was late. And uh, people will find this. This is a guy that bring the girlfriend and, hey, take me a picture. And you can see that he hangs, I don't know how many crosses around his, his, uh, his neck and the girl trying to take the picture of him just to make it a little bit kind of a, a spooky, I mean, who is shooting a portrait in the cemetery, right? <laughs> but this this occasion, 
allowed. And of course, um, this lady spent, I remember, hours, hours trying to put all this together. And um, I found it very, very interesting what has gone on during these times, right? So candles, that is the only light that is really directed in, uh, impacting her, her for the photography. So you need to take advantage of that. And you start to walk and you find these people that in a normal day, for some people will find it scary to be walking. This is 11, 10 or 11 p.m. at night in a cemetery. And you find these couple of people just walking there. You can tell it's raining, that's why the umbrellas. And um, so you find all these kind of elements. But as you can see, many of the, of the graves are already fully decorated and ready to go for the following day, very humble. People's taking pictures about the altar that they may be fixed. And, but it's a wet night, it's, but it's a challenge, but also it's a very, very pleasant challenge to be walking all around this. This is a cemetery actually even far uh, further uh, uh, in the north of the city. So this is totally different cemetery. And this is one where uh, if you are lucky enough in a good day, you will see a lot more action happening. Now you, uh, you brought the story about this, uh, this boy. Um, oh, yes. Yes, well, this is a homeless boy. Uh, uh, I only have a very few moments to, to, to talk to him, trying to understand what he was doing because he brought to me my attention that, of course, uh, I see, I read all the names that are engraved there. And I asked him, hey, uh, what are you doing? And he told me, well, I, I come to try to arrange a little bit better the, the, the grave of my, of my family. Is the, the mother, the father, the... Um, the brother and the sister that die, and he's alone. He's left alone. Uh, no matter what, he's trying to keep the the the, the tradition alive. So, with a few coins that maybe he collected during the previous days, he was able to buy two, three uh, candles and whatever stones find around the grave. He's trying to put together and arrange it the best he can. And I feel a lot of respect for him because no matter how homeless or poor he is he keep alive a tradition. So it's not about how much power you have economically, it's about the intention to keep your, your, your relatives alive. So this one was a very touching moment that it made me reflect about how lucky I am in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in many things. And, but it made me happy to know that people, no matter what, it will keep alive the traditions. Right. Now, um... <clears throat> coming to our, our tail section here, Francisco. Uh, Francisco is actually, um... Put together this little presentation, I guess, wrapping everything up on what you know the, the final the final part of Dia de Muertos. Um, so here is his short story. Well, um, this uh, it puts together everything related to what uh, all the other topics we just saw. So this is a moment that by accident I found because I walk that day inside the the county cemetery. Um, the first thing you find is this, that it's not a cemetery, it's a garden. It's full of flowers, it's full of uh, life. So in any moment, you feel it sad. Just that color I may, already made you happy. So I started to walk around all the, the graves and see all these people uh, doing their best they can to arrange the, 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 the graves. And you find people of different uh, stratus um, arranging that. Um, so you will find people, uh, this, this altar, so the graves become an altars, and you see people either putting water, some, uh, you can see this lady is only one flower and some petals of the flower. And in the background is a guy that maybe can afford to have a little bit, of, a little bit more a pot with the flowers on it. So this tells you the difference that exists among the, 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 the families. This is a little bit a grave more, uh, with a little bit more uh, decor, and the lady cleaning it, preparing it, leaving it ready for it. And um, the interesting part is arrived to a corner in, uh, in this uh, county cemetery that it catch my eye. And it catch my eye because besides that you have all the government uh, big trees there, this tree is not natural from there. It's the true, the, 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 the Bougainvillea tree. And the characteristics about this tree is that it offer flower across the year. It's all the year they have that. So it's how I met this family, the Navarro family, 
uh, you can see the responsibles, the, the, the guy in glasses and the kid holding the beer in the, in the red uh, custom. And that's the family Navarro. And the guy was telling me, um, the, the, the father was telling me that this is the grave where his parents are, are resting. And the, and, and the mother lost flowers. And he found out that he cannot come every day to the grave and give her flowers, but he found out that the plant in this tree will give every single day of the year flowers to his mother. So that is the way that he connects with the mother. And the son, he, he has a group called Comparsa. The Comparsa is a group of performers that they will go for days around different grades, bringing music and performance to among the, the assistants. In this case, unfortunately, the night before, one, uh, one relative of one of the members has passed, but they were there present doing that. And after they finish this ceremony, they just start to walk all around the graves and things like that. They invite me also to be part of it. And uh, that is how I end following a little bit around this dancing. So they dancing, they singing, and they finally arrive to the, to the, to the grave of, 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 in this case, the grandparents of, of this kid. And it's a moment that uh, it put together what is in all the, the ambience, right? It's a, mem a moment to remember his, his friend is, is asking him, remember your grandparents, how they used to live, how happy they were, and they are already seeing you from, from above. So they are protecting you you really need to remember. And of course that will pull some tears, right? Uh, this, you cannot avoid to, uh, uh, that little bittersweet moment. So, so you can capture later their faces, how they change from this time that they're looking into the sky into a little bit uh, uh, a moment. And when I see this picture and I capture this tattoo on him, it reminds me how really families are in Mexico. Family, Kitty say that the family is a place where the dreams were begin and where they will keep. And that is very important. So after that moment, of course, as, as a good Mexican, they need to be brave. We need a little bit of drink to, to have the value and start to sing the favorite songs of their grandparents. So they will be singing their souls out and they really perform for, for maybe eight, 10 hours. And you can see in the next picture how they are uh, really blasting as much as they can, they really want their grandparents to be uh, uh, hear all these songs that they are doing for that. And during the performance, of course, you see the family around, uh, remember and, uh, uh, and being respectful. Although that guy over there from the group uh, is trying to, to make fun of it, that to make it actually attractive and thing like that. And at the, end, at the end of all the performance with the musicians, with the actors, of course, the clapping and the smiles. As you can see, no one is. And to see this couple of uh, father and son remembering the grandparents, it makes me feel uh, connected to my father a, a lot more. And this is the way that uh, families are. Females are together, not just for a happy moments, for the moments that are hard, but we understand that uh, to remember our family is the way to keep them alive. So I'm very thankful for this family, the family Navarro, that allowed me to be part of their life, one moment of their life. So. So it was a very pleasant adventure there. Discovering the stories of others is uh, it's probably one of the best things about photography, right? Absolutely. Um, what is behind, right? The photograph. Right. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing all these pictures. Very, uh, very deep and obviously very personal um, and professional at the same time. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Do we want to go ahead and skip and just pick one? We, we have time for like one more question before we do our, our closing, uh, our closing announcements. Mm -hmm. Anything in there that you want to answer in your own? Uh, well, um, I seen. Well, they, they come from all over the states. Wow. Uh, uh, well, first, I want to thank you for all your questions. Uh, someone is asking between the Q and the CL, which one do you prefer, uh, and why? Uh, I think um, it depends. Uh, if you want to have the versatility to be uh, changing lenses, I will go for the CL. If you want to have only one camera to travel, I will choose the Q. I even call always, always a queue, like a the perfect travel companion. Uh, and, um, uh, some other questions about, um, we got uh, I remember. 
how are you going to be celebrating in Chicago this year? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, um, actually, I will be celebrating online with my daughters. My daughter keep the tradition, they can, both in Canada, and my oldest daughter keep the tradition alive. So she is having a shrine, an altar inside the home with the photographs of all our ancestors. And that's why she made me very, actually, she made me very proud to continue the tradition. As you can see, the kids are important to keep the traditions. So that is the way that I'm gonna be celebrating. Uh, I will invite, if you allow me, Philip, that if they have more questions about it, they can contact me through my Instagram account or through, through my mail, to my web page. And I will be very, very happy to answer some of the questions. Yeah, and we've got, uh, we've got your slide coming up here. Stay in touch with Francisco Marin. Uh, I'm gonna leave this slide up for a couple, about a minute here. It's his website and his Instagram work. Now, uh, Francisco, we always ask this question at the end of all of our Leica conversations. Tell You're me. trapped on an island. You had one camera and one lens you could take with you. What's it gonna be? What camera and what lens? Okay, at this moment, the way I feel, the Q2. The Q2? Yeah. I will bring that. I think uh, it brings a great, um, it's very versatile right now. For the needs that we have, I think right now I will bring that one. Yeah, the weather ceiling will help on an island too, right? When it's all wet. <laughs> <laughs> I will have a talk later about that. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.